Proverbs tonight. Uh, like I said, I, you know, some of the, those parts of Ezekiel, I just, you know, I want to, I, we, we need to read them. They are part of the word of the Lord. When Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, as we looked at in Sunday school this morning, at least in one class, uh, we looked at what Jesus said about that uh, not one iota, not one jot and tittle, not one of the littlest bits of the law will the law and the prophets will pass away. He didn't come to abolish those. And in those prophets, that includes the book of Ezekiel. Jesus is talking about Ezekiel. And so if Jesus thought it was important enough to say, hey, you can't throw Ezekiel away, then we need to read it. We don't have to understand it all. The parts of Scripture, and, and Jesus even says that. You know, he actually talks about this in Matthew 5. He says, not even the least of the law and the prophets will be abolished. That means that in his opinion, there are some parts that are lesser than other parts. And since he wrote it, because all Scripture is god breathed if he says some of it's less, it's all important, but some of it's not as important as other parts. If you can imagine, for example, the manual, the, the owner's manual for your car. There are some parts of it that are more important on an everyday basis than other parts. You don't have to know every day how to change the thermostat out in your engine. At least I hope you don't. But every now and then, you're going to need to know that. By the way, in a Dodge Grand Caravan, you take out the two bolts, you pull it out there, the antifreeze goes everywhere. <laughs> then you find all the parts of the broken thermostat, you pull them out, you stick the new one in, you put the two bolts back in. Every now and then, you have to know that. Other things you have to know all the time. Parts of Ezekiel are more about that deep maintenance and those what's really going on and how it's really working. Other parts of Scripture are more like that part in your car manual that says, for example, that the pedal on the left makes it stop, the pedal on the right makes it go. And there's this amazing little thing on the left-hand side that you push down and push up, and it lets other drivers know which direction you're going to turn. It's this really cool thing, the turn signal. And it, it's, it's, a, it's something that is known to somewhere around a fourth of the population on the roads in the United States of America. Somewhere around 75% of Americans don't even realize the car will do that. <laughs> it's all about those. Yeah. So, and no, I, have, I didn't follow Gary driving home, so I don't know. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, th that's just, you know, there are parts that are more important that are crucial for every day, and there are other things that are occasionally you're going to hit that and go, wow, that actually connects with this. This actually reminds us of this. And so the Proverbs, I think, fall under kind of that turn signal section, and they're worth knowing. They're, they're valuable for everyday life. In Proverbs 17, I picked 17, so we're on the 17th, and one of the things that we're doing as a family is that on the 17th, we read Proverbs chapter 17 this morning, everybody in our family was supposed to, and we copied... Uh, Verse, eight, verse 18 and verse 28 into our books. Uh, here in another three months, we'll have our own, all five of us will have our own hand copy, uh, copies of the books of Proverbs, book of Proverbs, so that we will have been through it all, not only having read it multiple times, but actually handwritten it out. And to the couple of you that are in the technological phase of life right now, there is nothing that beats actually writing something to get it into your head can't type it and remember it near as well as you can if you handwrite. So you may want to type it all, but you got to write some of it. But this is this is one of the things we're doing. So I picked Proverbs 17. Of course, I'm not going to read you this whole thing, but I want to point you to a couple of a uh, couple of things that, that, that are helpful here. Uh, first of all, take a look at verse 2. A servant who acts wisely will rule over a son who acts shamelessly and will share an in inheritance among brothers. And then come on down. Where is that verse? I lost the verse I was looking for. Ah, verse 22. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Verse 25. A foolish son is a grief to his father, and bitterness to her before him. 
So when you see some of these, we see that wisdom, and if you read all of the chapter, you, you'll really catch this. You can't separate wisdom in Proverbs, which is living righteously in the fear of God. It's wisdom. You can't separate wisdom from joy. We talk about that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You can't really get that joy without building the wisdom. Now, wisdom is not hyper-specialized knowledge in, a cer in certain things. Okay, It has nothing to do with your mathematical skills or your ability to memorize history dates or knowing exactly where the commas go when you write sentences or anything of that sort. Those are knowledge things that are helpful in life depending on what you're doing. Wisdom is about knowing how to live righteously in the fear and obedience of the Lord. And you cannot separate that wisdom from joy. If you live with wisdom, that helps build joy. Wisdom brings joy. So before you start thinking, well, all this proverb stuff just kind of bogs us down. No, wisdom and joy go hand in hand together. Wisdom knows certain things, like it's better, you know, better a dry morsel of where love is than a feasting in a household strife. It's better to eat crackers with people you love than get to go out and dine in five-star restaurants and have to spend all your time arguing when you're there. Some of y'all married people need to think about this. Some of y'all not married but going to be married someday people need to think about this. It is better to be in a relationship where you're able to enjoy each other's company than to be in a relationship where you get to go on expensive, go do expensive stuff all the time. Now, blessed are you and us and anybody else when you have the opportunity to have both. But if you have to choose between spending your time with people that can spend money to have nice stuff and spending your time with people that you enjoy being with, Take your time being with the people that you enjoy being with. Better to split a happy meal with somebody you love than to have your own steak and spend your time with people that you just absolutely despise. Unless, of course, you can get carry out from the steak place and then go spend the time with people you love. Then, you know, take the beef and run. But this is what, you know, this is part of life. That joy comes from that wisdom of knowing that. Wisdom is knowing that you can just, that there are some things you're better off without. As much as it is about knowing that there are some things that, you know, that there are things that you want and how to get them. Wisdom is knowing, you know what? I've learned how to make a million dollars, but I've realized I don't need it. And I don't want it because I could make that million and lose everything that actually matters to me. Joy strengthens your life, though. A joyful heart is a good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. We can spend our days chasing all sorts of ways to try to keep ourselves alive and, and lengthen our life. And a lot of it we ought to do. We ought to do the best that we can do to keep, you know, keep ourselves functional, to be useful in God's kingdom. But it starts with putting the joy of the Lord inside of us and letting the Lord work that joy out. You're better off if you're, if you're half as fast running but joyful than you are if you run faster and faster and faster. Now, I'm not saying you have to be joyful when you run. Just joyful the rest of the time. I don't see how anybody is joyful when they run. But a joyful heart does good like a mess. Remember Jerry Clower always loved to talk about that verse. He talked about how you know, he felt like that was one of the things that he did was the work of the Lord and helping people have a joyful heart. Because it's hard to stay sick when you're laughing. It's hard to stay ill when you're doing things that you enjoy when you get that opportunity. So when I used to be sick and had to miss school, I'd lay up on the couch and watch comedies all day. Plus I was not in school so I could lay up on the couch and watch TV all day. But I always wanted to watch the funny stuff. By the way, that's one of the drawbacks for those of you that wonder about us homeschooling. They don't get sick days. 
take your smarty self to your room, get your work done. <laughs> That's the way it works. So the joyful heart does good like medicine. You meet those people that are so sour and grumpy, and they're sick all the time. And then you meet people that are joyful, and even sometimes they've got the same medical problems that they that, that the grumpy people have. But they, the way they face them is different. Be joyful. Be cheerful. It helps. A few other things to highlight here. Verse 15. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous. Both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. Justifies the wicked and condemns the righteous. That's a bad thing. We need to be careful as we look at this, as we look at elections and government and all these things that the government does. Don't condemn the righteous just because they're not in your political party. Don't justify the wicked just because they are. Judge based on their actual actions, their actual attitudes, their actual commitments. Because it's an abomination to the Lord to justify the wicked. No matter how you think you can justify it. Well, I can justify this wicked guy because if I put him in office, I know that money will come back to me. I can, ju I can justify this wicked person because if they get into office, they'll fix all the health insurance problems. As much as I'd like the health insurance problems fixed, it doesn't justify anybody being wicked. Condemning the righteous. Sometimes people do the right thing. Nobody understands why they did it. So the world condemns them for it. We shouldn't jump in on that. It's a bad thing. Verse 14. The beginning of strife is like letting out water. So abandon the quarrel before it breaks out. There's a difference in being too weak to stand up for something that's right. And having the wisdom to say, you know what? I'm not going to argue about this. I'm going to count my piece. I'm going to say, I'm going to say my piece and count to ten and walk away. And be done with it. We're not going to have this argument. There's really only one set of parents with kids at home in here. So, you know, I'll say this to, you know, for, for, for our sakes. It will transform your parenting, your grandparenting, your parenting, even if your children are adults. It will transform your marriage, your work relationships, and a lot of your other relationships if you will occasionally look at somebody and say, you know, I'm pretty convinced that I'm right, but I know that where this is going is a big argument, a strife that breaks out. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to extinguish this before it, before it gets out of hand. We're not going to have this argument. And I'm going to walk away. Now, probably going to upset the other person when you do that. They might get a little mad. But sometimes you have to diffuse it, walk away, and come back and talk about it when you can actually talk about the issue. Talk about the problem. Sometimes what you've got to do is send your kid to their room and say, you go to your room, I'm going to my room, we'll come back and talk about it in a few minutes. Those of you that are dealing with adult children, sometimes you need to say, you know, I, I would like to talk to you about this, but right now this feels emotionally charged. And I don't want to yell at you, and I'm not going to have you yell at me. But we do need to talk about it, so let's talk about it later. And by later, I mean tomorrow evening at 7.30. We're going to talk about it. Diffuse the strife, and then have the conversation. It is the better direction to go. Same thing in churches. Sometimes folks wonder, why did that happen? You know, why is it that the preacher never, never got, you know, the preacher didn't get in that person's face about this? Because sometimes it's better to extinct, let just let the quarrel go away. I don't want to start an argument. Not because I don't want to stand up for certain things, but sometimes you realize this is not a battle worth the fighting. Be careful. Avoid trouble if it's possible. Verse 4, an evil, evildoer listens to wicked lips, and a liar pays attention to a destructive tongue. Who do you listen to? Who are your influences? Who 
do you listen to about life? Who do you listen to about the decisions that you need to make? Wise people? Righteous people? Unrighteous people? Who do you listen to just for the sake of listening to them? I occasionally fall in this trap and turn on talk radio and listen to it. Now that sports are coming back, it's a little easier because they're just arguing about sports and they're not talking about anything of substance. But it's real easy to turn on and listen to political talk radio knowing that some of those people are wicked, liars, and deceivers, and yet I let them be the people I listen to. And that's not wise. That's why certain email addresses are now just completely blocked because I couldn't get them to unsubscribe me from the list. Signed up because they were giving away a gun and I didn't win it and they, quit, they wouldn't quit sending me emails. But I don't want to listen to them. Because nothing profits from listening to a liar. The refining pot, verse 3, the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests hearts. Your heart will be tested across the years. And it will not be easy. This morning we talked about the idea of, you know, sometimes we have to realize that our relationship with God and our obedience has to come above our commitment to the land, our commitment to our traditions, our commitment to anything else that's outside of obedience to God. And it can even be good things. It can be places that we have thrived before, that we thought would be a good land to be in. And when that test comes, sorry, my daughter is laughing at me. Um, when that test comes, it's funny that she gets tickled like this. Uh, when that test comes, we have to focus on the Lord. And think about it. The refining pot for gold and for silver, that's hot, that's challenging, that's difficult. The testing of our hearts is not always going to be easy. So we need to be careful with that. We just thought they'd just start laughing. <laughs> Everybody's going to be healthy right there. Because of <laughs> finally, we come back to that first verse. Better is a dry morsel and quietness with it than a house full of feasting with strife. What do you want? What do you really want out of life? So you say, well, I'm old enough. I'm so old now, there's no reason for me to change my mind about what I want. Or they even think about it. But yes, you got years left. So what do you want? Do you want to have everything that you could possibly have, everything under the sun, whether it causes strife or not? Or are you okay eating tins of potted meat, dry saltine crackers and drinking water, but being with the people that you love, being able to have that relationship. Too many times, people destroy their families to have stuff for their family. And it doesn't end up in divorces, and it doesn't end up in fractured homes. It just ends up with homes with people who sit around the table and don't get along with each other. Or even worse, never bother to sit around the table anyway because they're all so busy going every direction. Because this one's got to be here and that one's got to be there. Mom and Dad both have to work full-time jobs to pay for all the activities that the kids are in so they have a full and robust childhood. And they never actually have a moment to sit down. Trade and feasting and have the relationship. Whether it's in your family, or for us as a church. I'm looking forward to it in a couple of weeks if we sit back, get back to sit down and sitting around the table and visiting with each other. I've missed that all summer. Here in a couple of weeks, we've got a Sunday morning that just kind of falls in the gap on our Sunday school literature. And I think that we're going to have, I don't know what the full plan is going to be for it, but that last Sunday of this month, I think we're going to do something um, for all the Sunday school classes that want to take part, if your Sunday school class doesn't want to, you won't have to, but I think we'll do something for all of us together as a church during Sunday school that will be relaxed, except for, for a few of you who will be put on the spot, those who tend to skip out and you know, 
not teach their class very often, for example. <laughs> Those of you who call me when you need a Sunday school teacher, guess what? I'm about to call you. Uh, but, you know, we're going to do some of those things to have those opportunities. Will all of the napkins be exactly right? Will we all eat with perfectly proper table manners? No. But we'll have a meal where love is. And that's what matters the most. So I want to encourage you to chase after that with your life. More than having.